Having a full service agency was not a business that Jen Ennis planned for when she started offering graphic design services as a freelancer back in 2014. Jen credits a series of small, pivotal moments in her journey, adding up to the business she has now. In this episode, we explore those small but mighty moments, including a lesson in pricing that set her up for success and how one project changed her confidence and the trajectory of her business. Welcome to the Small But Mighty Agency Podcast. If you're a creative consultant or agency owner who wants to know what the roller coaster ride really looks like to grow your business from one to many, you're in the right place. My guest and I pull back the curtains on the realities of growing and running agencies of different sizes and what it takes to build a team. And if you're anything like me, you want more than the highlight reel. You want to learn from the mistakes of others so that you can stop short of making the same mistakes. I'm your host, Audrey Joy Kwan. I spend my days as a coach and consultant to multiple six and seven figure agency owners. For the last seven years, I've been behind the scenes helping people grow, lead, and operate small but mighty agencies. Here at the Small But Mighty Agency podcast, we'll uncover what works and equally as important what didn't work to get these business owners to where they are today. Hey, Jen, congratulations. I know that you and your team are nominated for the 2020 Georgie Award as a top three best websites finalist. For listeners wondering what is the Georgie Award, it's an industry award presented by the Canadian Home Builders Association. It's such a wonderful time for us to have you on the show, Jen, and share your journey from being a freelancer to having a creative agency and now a full service agency. Before we dig in, tell us about your business, what you do, and who's on your team. Hi, Audrey. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a privilege to be here with you. Yes, so our business is Janice Design Co. And we've more shortened it recently to JD Co. And our business is a digital agency. We're exclusively digital. And we actually started that way even before the pandemic. So when COVID hit, it was a very natural transition to continue to go with the flow. So we are an all digital agency. We Our team members are across Western Canada and we have a small but very wonderfully skilled team, which we're very thankful to have. Jen, how did you start your business? Very unintentionally. <laughs> <laughs> I um I never saw myself having a business. I never, you know, if you had asked my parents or growing up, I don't think running a business would have been what people would have associated with me. But uh, here I am. And it's kind of funny how it started. So I actually worked in nonprofit for our church for after graduating from post-secondary education in graphic design and into creative development for over 15 years. Loved my job. I worked with my mom and dad, worked with my family and really loved it. And then in 2013, they had asked if I would be willing to release my role and move into a board of directors position. So of course, I was no longer able to stay on staff. And so with that transition uh, meant that I had to start taking on contract work. And so the church retained me on contract, but I also needed to continue to bring in other work. And so I had done some freelance over the years on the side and reached out to those connections and kind of just started to pick up work and our business began to grow from there. When did the switch go off? Or another way to put it, when did you have that aha moment that you wanted to have an agency? Yeah. And I, again, because I never really set out with that in mind, that kind of just, we grew really just kind of as projects began to come in and I started to realize, okay, a scope maybe was beyond my own personal expertise where the workload became too much for me personally to handle. I started subcontracting. I think the first big project came and when I, the first time I really realized, oh my goodness, I think this could be a legitimate business. And I knew it had been for others. I knew others in the industry, but again, like I said, I was a mom. I had two young kids at the time and I just didn't really see that being the direction that I would go, but the work kept coming. And I landed a really big contract. It was the first uh, five-figure contract I'd ever gotten. And that was the first time that I realized that this could actually be something long-term. At what point in your business did you decide to go from a freelancer into hiring the first few people? That's a great question. At what point? I think at the point, like I said, when I realized that the workload 
was beyond what I could continue to maintain and do with excellence on my own. And also being a mom of three, I recognize that there is this very tender tension to manage or balance of continuing to be the mom that I wanted to be, but also running a business. And so I knew with that, I would need to maybe bring on some extra help so that I could continue to have the time that I wanted and needed to raise my young children. And so that was probably the moment when the workload and the family demands were both high that I thought, okay, I can't outsource motherhood and I don't want to, but I can get Mm -hmm. some design help. And so, like I said, I maybe have done things a little bit uh, backwards, but that was when we started to bring on extra help and it was great. And we, we brought on great team members that helped lighten the workload a little bit so that I could continue to do things like baseball practice and school runs and field trips and stuff like that. Jen, what did the workload look like for you? That's a great question. It has changed a lot. And as anybody who is in this industry or any industry, there's ebbs and flows to it. So I think the workload looked like lots of task management, lots of design hours. I I think also it was hiring out the design side of things so that I could also continue to maintain the business side of things because as any business owner knows, like... The love for me is in the design. I love doing the design side, but there's also a lot of administrative stuff to running a business. And so when some of those tasks and making sure that the business side, the administrative side, client management, project management stuff was starting to really grow and be a lot to just kind of make sure that I kept my pulse on things so that we didn't miss anything. Those were some of the key indicators for me that, hey, maybe I need to bring in some help on the design side because I can't really hire somebody to do all those other things that I'm doing right now, but I can bring on somebody to help with this side of things. When your agency was focused on design items and you were hiring out those design tasks, where did you pivot your time to? Well, I still did a lot of the design tasks, but I pivoted it more to creative direction. So I found that my clients were pulling on me a lot more for consulting and strategy. I actually really enjoyed that. That's What I did previously and probably where I found personally, as much as I love designing, um, my greatest strength and the greatest way that I could serve my clients was on the strategy and consulting side. And I felt like that's where I could best help them. And so as my time was being allocated more there, providing brand strategy, positioning, um, guiding them through that process, then I was able to bring on designers to kind of help with the execution of it. What was the impact on your business when you were able to create more space for yourself to focus on creative strategy? As a result of that, our business actually grew. And so as much as it was a step of faith really to bring somebody on, and I think for any small business owner, there's this moment where you realize you're going to have to invest a little bit to bring somebody on. And it's a bit of a risk because you really hope that the work comes in to continue not to pay for their salary, but also pay you and cover business expenses. So there's a, there's a level of risk to that. But every time we've stepped out and done that, our business has only grown. And so, yeah, it's only been, made us better. But what it sounds like to me is that when you made the hire and were able to step out of the design role, it was a natural pivot for you that you were able to tap into what you do really well, which is the creative strategy. And that pivoted your business towards becoming more of a creative agency focused on providing the strategic elements and not just design requests. Exactly. It was a very natural pivot. And, you know, I feel like our business, some businesses grow really fast and that's so great. They have the structure of the strategy, maybe the investment, the financial security to make that happen. Our business has grown quite slowly. And I've been very okay with that. Um, So that pivot did happen quite naturally. I don't feel like it was a forced transition. It just kind of was like, oh, we're here. Okay, let's just one step at a time. Let's just manage this step. And then we go to the next one. Okay, let's manage this one. So it was not really this pivotal moment, rather lots of little pivotal moments that brought us there. Let's stop and highlight what you just said. The journey to growing or scaling a business is not necessarily one big pivotal decision, but a series of smaller decisions along the way. There's a lot to be said for the value of slow growth. Before we go on, on behalf of the listeners who might be wondering, wait, what is the difference between boutique design services and a creative agency? How do you define that? Yeah, that's a great question because we definitely started out, or I personally started out more boutique graphic design 
which is where my education lied and so on. So that would be more, or at the time for us, it looked more like exclusive to print or digital design services, logos, brochures, marketing materials, websites, et cetera, to when we pivoted more to creative agency, we began to offer every scope of creative work. And these pieces were just kind of added on as, you know, different projects required different scopes. We started to include different services and bring on different team members that that was their skill set. So I'd like to refer to it as everything the client needs from concept to completion uh, with being a creative agency. And so that might look like brand positioning, consulting services, brand audits, growth strategy, so on, um, all formats of graphic design, for print to digital. We manage also social media for our clients, so content strategy, custom content creation, account management reporting. And then we also do our websites are all custom built. So from the design to the back end, and we manage back end development, maintenance, IT, uh, industrial design, like signage, exhibition displays. And then we also do video creative. We've done a lot of custom work for our clients through 2020 from script writing to editing and production management. So it really uh, covers the entire creative scope that a client may need. So as that scope grew, did your team grow? Oh, absolutely. I would say the scope grew because our team grew. Who did you add in your team in order to be able to command a larger scope? Who did I add? Well, we added the first person that I added was actually a web developer. So going away from template based websites for clients to the custom websites was a big step for us for just our company personally. So web development, all the back end, because that's not my area of expertise. Having somebody who really knew and understood that and did that well was that was huge for us. And really a part, I think you mentioned the Georgia award nomination and making it to top finalists. I would have to say a lot of that was their work and, you know, really thankful for great quality team members. And so I, I think as the scope was presented to us, we were asked to bid on projects that maybe included certain aspects of a scope that we had never covered before. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, having been in the industry for a while and having some great relationships and network connections, I was able to pull on people that I had worked with in the past and pull them in, some of them working exclusively with us and others just as kind of our exclusive subcontractors. They're always the people that we go to for that piece of the puzzle. Jen, you mentioned a pivotal point in your business was when you landed your first five-figure client. Can you share more about that? Yeah, it was a it was a big learning experience. I look back on that and there are so many aspects to that project that I now would do so differently. But at the same time, it was so exciting. And I think along the way, whether it was then, so that would have been 2014, I think, or now, it's clients have really taken faith in us and believed in us and given us the opportunity. I owe a lot to them, you know, when they could have hired the bigger agency and they chose to give us a chance. I think a lot of these opportunities have been because we've had the privilege of working with great people who really gave us a shot, you know, and this was one of those projects where we, it was the first time we ever bid. It was the first time I ever bid. I shouldn't say we, it was just me at the time. It was the first time I ever bid on a project. And a friend of mine had actually referenced me to this client and had said, Hey, would you give her a chance to bid on the project? And so she said to me, you know, no guarantee, but if you'd like to put in a bid, this would be a great opportunity for you. I actually think you could do it. And so I put in the bid and I sent it to her first before I gave it to the client. And she was like, oh my goodness, Jen, you are not charging enough. And that was the first time I'd ever heard that. And she really walked me through it. She had great business experience. And she walked me through it and said, hey, this is what this would be worth. And I had no frame of reference for pricing. I, I was coming out of a nonprofit. I knew how to do the work, but I had no idea even how to price the work professionally. And so she was, she really mentored me through that process and she got my foot in the door, helped me get my foot in the door. And um, when I met with them, they kind of, they went through it and then they did an interview process and I just really connected with them and had a great time talking with them. And I think they maybe just, gave it to me because I don't know, they just, they gave it to me. And we had so much fun, Audrey, on that project. I really grew to love that group of people, love working with them and was really interested in what they wanted to accomplish. So I think that sense of camaraderie with the client where we built a really great relationship is what helped make that project so successful. And it was, and it turned out amazing. And they were very happy with it in the end. And it kind of boosted my confidence to be like, okay, I think I can do this. And, um, you know, sometimes you just need those projects where you learn and you grow and it gives you some confidence to go into the next 
go into the next one feeling like, okay, I have a win under my belt, so I can do this. Sometimes people see in us what we can't see in ourselves. And your example here, what is most powerful to me is that all it takes is one person to believe in us and one project to light the fire. So how did that experience change how you priced your services? It definitely changed it a lot. I think I'd unvalued myself. And, you know, having since speaking to a lot of other industry professionals who are maybe just starting out in this industry, I just talked to somebody recently and um, she showed me her work, what she was charging. So I think there's times where you get paid an experience and you should, and it's maybe not the monetary value that you should get, but you're getting paid with a, you know, a portfolio or an experience. But then there's times where you've kind of done the hard legs on that and you could start pricing professionally. I had a great mentor and still in touch with him. And he um, developed brands for Apple, British Airways, you know, some of these really big brands. And he gave me some really good resources and really helped walk me through. He was familiar with my work. I'd worked with him enough. And uh, having a good mentor guide me through that and give me the confidence to say, you can charge for this. I've seen your work. I know how you work. And this is what you can charge it was really helpful for me because then I felt like I wasn't just pulling a number out of left field. And I was pricing in a way that was competitive that was reflective of my experience and uh, wasn't underselling myself, but also wasn't overselling myself. What would you say to someone who is thinking about a strategic way to increase their prices? So there's a season, I think, where you have to take the experience so that you can get to the point where you charge that. So I remember trying that based on just kind of like, I think I could charge more. And I know not that, that was before this big project. And I had one client really kind of slap my hand on it and they were right to do so. And they said, you know, uh, we can't do that. And they, they laid out some really good reasons. And it was hard to hear. It was hard to take, but they were right. And I had to receive that and kind of take a deep breath and be like, okay, you know, I'm going to learn from that. And so I think there's, there's moments where you just take, you take the experience, get paid for your work, but you take the experience and then you get to the point where you're right. You get, you say, okay, now I need to have the resources available to expand and grow my team. And it got to the point where we were there and uh, had built up enough experience, enough work experience. Our portfolio was starting to speak for itself. And at that point, we could change our pricing structure and our pricing model and, and move in that direction. Jenna, I think what you said there was key is that you had this portfolio of work already. And I think there is a lot of information out there about raising your prices and charging more. And there is a season where that happens. And it's when you've built out the credibility and the portfolio. Mm -hmm. If you're just starting your business, then what you want to do is learn by experience and build a portfolio. That's where the value of working for and charging less than what someone who has been in the industry for like 10 years is charging. Exactly. I actually just spoke recently with a student student who graduated from art school, she was very gifted, very talented, but her portfolio was exclusively limited to the work that she had done in design school. So she had just asked for a call to kind of talk about the industry. I was happy to connect with her. And I asked her what she was charging because she had said, oh, I'm not getting freelance work. And so I had asked her what she was charging per hour. I said, how are you pricing this? What type of agreement are you sending to clients? Some of those things that really are a part of running a business and running it well and offering great client services. And so that was something when she mentioned to me, I, the advice that I gave to her was consider lowering your prices for now. It's not going to be like that forever. You will get paid. Your work experience will speak for itself. It won't be like this forever, but lower it to build your portfolio for now. You know, she would have still been getting paid great, but it wasn't sometimes when you see what others are getting paid. And I think that's where the comparison game is never fair. You know, you can't charge like you've been in the industry for 15 years when you're just coming out of school because it, it just doesn't work that way. So it will come, but you need to market and price yourself in a fair way. And when you do that, you actually will get the work and build a portfolio. But if you are, if you're not aware of that and you're not, mature enough to recognize that you actually limit yourself from getting the work you actually want to get to grow. Yes. It's it's kind of the stages of growing your business. At first, you got to charge a little less to gain the experience. And then you have a portfolio that you can present and show proof of your concept. And then you can charge more after that. But if you come out of the gate right away with this really big number and you have no experience behind you, there's a gap in terms of why someone would want to hire you. In fact, they're going to look at it and think that, hey, this experience that this person has is really not co not connected to the pricing that they have. And then they're just not going to hire you. And it becomes so much more difficult to build the business. Exactly. That's it. Exactly. 
So it's a, it, there's actually a resource that this mentor that I was referencing first suggested that I get, and it was a game changer for me. And if other designers listening who are freelancers and want to grow their business, I would suggest getting this book. And it's based out of the Graphic Designers Guild of New York. They release a book every couple of years, and it's a pricing guide and ethical guidelines. And they're actually just releasing a new one this May. And it was a really helpful resource for me in understanding pricing structure, ethical guidelines, and contracting. Thanks, Jen. I'll add the link to that book in the show notes. Before we get back to the episode, I want to invite you to the free Strategic Connections Roundtable, where creatives, consultants, and service-based business owners can meet new business connections without the awkwardness of traditional networking. It's a curated experience where the group fit is curated so that connections and conversations thrive. That means that every month, a Strategic Connections Roundtable will bring together a group of service-based business owners in similar stages of business who can benefit from knowing each other so that you can make connections easier, share what your business offers, discover new resources, and have an opportunity to mastermind a challenge. Save your free seat at audreyjoyquan.com forward slash strategic dash connections dash roundtable. Above all, I care about genuine connections and authentic relationships in business. If that's you, check out the roundtable and curated networking experience today. You can get all the details and onto the free invite list over at audreyjoyquan.com forward slash strategic dash connections dash roundtable or or click on the link in the show notes right there in your podcast app. Back to the show. Over the last couple of years, you've added in services like Guide Digital Strategy and brought in contractors to do things like paid ads. Why this direction? Because we feel like obviously we're in a very digital world. Print isn't obsolete and there's definitely times where I've told clients stick traditional. But the reality is that our world of creative is going very digital. And so I think when it comes to that is actually part of the brand strategy. And if it's not, it should be a part of the brand strategy. So I think when I say we go concept to completion, we want to make sure that all their bases are covered, that wherever their brand touch points are creatively, we're helping ensure that the client has a strategy in place, that they're not saying something on one platform and then it's coming through differently on another platform because, you know, uh, an end user could see it in one place and then they see it somewhere else. And because there's not a cohesiveness to it, it gets lost in translation. So our goal is to make sure that it's completely consistent. And that's where that initial brand consulting strategy comes in. We work with them to make sure that their plan covers the entire scope of touch points. You know, we provide touch point maps and so on to really help our clients understand the value in that. And there is a lot of value in that. And it actually helps them maximize their growth and whether it be the sale of a product or services. Jen, I want to talk about your timeline. When I say timeline, what I mean is I want to know how long it took you to get to this iteration of your business. So Let's look at your business as three seasons. So the first season is you were a freelancer who was offering graphic design services. And then you uh, hired people into your business and pivoted to that creative agency that we talked about. And then you started adding in more of these digital functions. So if that was your business journey, can you share what that journey looked like in terms of years or in terms of timeline? That's a great question. So like I said, I really ventured out on my own in 2013, didn't start a business, but was freelancing. So that would have been the point where I was just freelancing. It wasn't even our main source of income personally. So I didn't feel the pressure to really build anything more just to maintain and supplement family income. So it wasn't this priority at the time. As it began to grow and I began to take on more projects, also our family life changed. And so I became the sole provider. And so I think that was a natural kind of pushed me into high gear. And so I began to pick up more projects. But I would say that season of freelancing like that was probably until about 2016. And that was when we actually incorporated our business. And so that was another big step. So when we incorporated, then we became an official business. And so my husband and I incorporated the business together and you know we continue to work together. He's more in the background, I'm in the foreground. And so that was a season. And then it wasn't until they mid 2018, that we started to get some really high end clients. And so that was another big shift where it wasn't just when I say freelance projects, it would have been like a brochure, brochure here. And you know, maybe a website here, it was like lots of just projects that we were working on for different clients. And at that point, by mid 2018, 
you know, a few years after 2013, they've been a few years already, then now we were getting full scopes where we were covering lots of different pieces. And so it started out with like a small scope and then, you know, grew into bigger scopes and bigger scopes and bigger scopes. And so that happened. And then we started to hire subcontractors to carry out different elements. But I wasn't ready at that point to bring on somebody consistently to help me because you know, the project ebb and flow was still pretty up and down. And so I didn't feel like our business could sustain somebody consistently. And then early 2020 was when we really started hiring. Early 2020, you started hiring. That's true. Yeah. Okay. So do you want to share a bit more about why early 2020, what happened in your business to inspire that hiring? Yeah. So we had, like I said, we had started taking on more scope of work, larger scopes of work, And so to help me manage, I think like we talked about before, to help me manage the workload as I continue to manage and run the business, I was still doing, I still do a lot of the design, but at that point, it was just the yes attitude of like, Hey, can your business do this? And I'd be like, yep, sure we can. And sometimes it was like, we'll figure it out later, you know? Right. And um, I'm going to say yes, and then I'll find somebody to do it. And that was, that's kind of always been the attitude that I've had is I'll just say yes. And if I can't do it personally, I know somebody who can, and I'll just, I'll hire them to help me with it. And so it had gotten to the point where uh, we were doing more and more projects like that. And so by 2020, I, I said to my husband, I don't think I can keep sustaining the really long hours that I have personally been putting in where I, you know, work all day and then put the kids to bed and I work all, you know, until late in the evening and doing that all the time. So I just felt like I was redlining. And it was that point that we were like, okay, we're going to step out. We're going to make that first. We hire two people and man, it took such a load off my plate and actually gave us opportunity to grow even more. And the two people that you hired, were they design related? Uh, Yeah, one was a designer and the other person was social media management. Adding in new people to the business and building a team requires a mentality switch. And while new people can take tasks off your plate, it also takes time to train people. What are your thoughts on that? There's something to be said about when you hire people, you still have to manage. So there's a leadership component to that where you know, you offload work to them, but you're also taking on more work for yourself because now you're managing their work. So (laughs) they were good and they were, they are good. They're amazing, but there's still not an element of, you know, managing their work. And sometimes what's tricky is I know I can do it because I am a designer by trade and not every creative agency owner is. And so sometimes I see stuff come through and I know what I want changed. And I really have to hold back to allow them to grow and learn when I could just jump into that file and tweak it and make it the way that I want it. And that's not fair to them. And so it's learning also how to manage leadership responsibilities and training and helping your team grow into who they're supposed to be. Yeah, I think we often forget when we make those first hires that the people you bring into your business, they need to be trained and then they need to be managed. And managing them is basically stopping yourself from doing the work, which means that if something comes back to you, you want to hold off from correcting it yourself, but providing them the guidance for them to understand what you're looking for. And all that takes time and work too. It absolutely does. But it's really important to do that work in the start. I can say now a year later with one of the designers that we have, she was amazing from the start, but she didn't know our clients the way that I did. She didn't even know how I worked, so to speak. And so it's learning all of those rhythms and how to work together as a team, like any team, whether you play a sport or whether you're in a band together, you have to learn how to allow yourself to work together. And I actually just said to her this week, I, how much I love working with her, how much I appreciate with her, because now I feel like we're at the point where a year later, we've done the work, we've done the hard work that we're so in sync that I feel like a client could look, say, at the design work and not know whether she did it or whether I did it, which is a great place to be. But it takes time to get there. And so I would say to anybody hiring, acknowledge the fact that that's going to happen, that you're going to have to take the time to train, to lead to correct gently, to manage expectations, to communicate over, over, over communicate and to appreciate and do all of those things. But it does pay off. I can't say enough about the importance of communications and setting clear expectations in order to have a self-managing team. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hard, especially because for me, I'm a natural people pleaser. I don't want anybody to be upset at me. And I really dislike confrontation. And I haven't figured this out completely, but I'm learning on how to be clear in my expectations, confident in my decisions, collaborative with the process, 
and quick to confront those small miscommunications before they have an opportunity to escalate. The role of leadership is exactly that. It's time invested to help people become their best selves. And the beauty of that is when they grow, your business does too. Because when they're doing their best work, they feel confident and then they're, they're more willing to continue to do that. So the more that I can help our team members become the best versions of themselves in their work and really support that, I'm, I benefit from that. Our clients benefit from that. So whether it is buying them a course to do online saying, hey, would this help you? Equipping them with resources, working hard on my end to make sure they have the systems and the structure to do their work well. It's working on those things to really help them do their best work. Okay, you just said something magical there. You said providing them the systems and the structure for them to do their work well, which lends well into the question that I have next. And that is, are there any particular systems or structures that you've implemented for your team that are working really well right now? That's a great question. We've done a lot through trial and error. I've tried a lot of different programs, software Our team has been very patient with me as I've tried to figure this out along the way. I do feel like recently, obviously, we work really well with Dropbox has been great for our business. I'm sure a lot of other creative agencies would say the same thing or something similar where we share files with clients that are private and secure and so on. So we manage a lot through Dropbox where we leave comments and notes on different design pieces. We, We also meet together weekly as a team because we're on Zoom. And so we do that. And then I, uh, we, we work off recently with Monday.com where we're managing projects and tasks. So it's finding those administrative. And then on the financial side with our team there, it's having systems in place to manage bookkeeping and so on. What's one thing about having an agency that you didn't expect? <laughs> having an agency. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. I think one thing that I didn't expect is how much fun it would be to meet new people and get to know so many different types of industries. We've talked a bit about what's working right now for you as an agency owner. I want to ask you, is there anything that isn't working for you right now that you would like to shine light on for other agency owners listening? That's a great question. I think what isn't working for me right now? I think recently, this is changing, but what wasn't working recently was the way that we had set up our backend bookkeeping and accounting. That's a really crucial part to running a business. And there was just some systems that we had in place that just weren't working. And so we had to make some decisions recently to make some structural changes there to make sure that that is always in tip top shape. And so I would even say to other agency owners, some of that stuff that isn't on the surface that nobody sees, it's like, I referred to it recently to somebody on our team. It's like the closet of your business where, you know, at home in your clothing closet, maybe throw some clothes in there, but you don't want anybody to see your closet because there's some stuff in there that doesn't look like pristine and proper. And I would say stuff like bookkeeping and some of that stuff could be the closet of your business. Nobody sees it. No, most people aren't going to see it. So you can make things look really good on the outside. You can have the best portfolio. But the reality is if some of that stuff isn't taken care of and taken care of well, it could cost you your business. And so that's a really important piece to make sure you have in place and done right. And I've learned that the hard way. So Jen, what keeps you inspired and at your best? Well, my faith absolutely is probably the most important thing inspired and at my best. So having the opportunity to serve and whether that is my family and my husband and my children, that keeps me at my best. And also serving through my church community and serving others, even within the nonprofit community. When I get outside of myself and look for ways to be a blessing to others, I think that's what keeps me at my best professionally. And one last question, where can people go to find you online? Great question. You can go to genesdesign.com or to our social media at genesdesign. Thanks for listening to the Small But Mighty Agency podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review on iTunes. It would mean the world to me. Or send a screenshot on Instagram while tagging me at Audrey Joy Kwan. 